so hi everyone, my name is Nicholas. I'm gonna talk about growing the language for graphics. So this is like my personal rant coming from a graphics data visualization guy on like what cool things we could have in JavaScript um, and things that are coming in JavaScript actually. So um, I do data visualization at Twitter. Um, some of the projects we do generally involve like web standards. Um, for example, this is the latest project I've been working on. Uh, it's a visualization that shows it's using WebGL, it shows the reach of a tweet by Obama, the four more years tweet, and it's subsequent retweets. So uh, this is using WebGL. Uh, we also use uh, data visualization, for example, in Hack Week, this project was uh, visualizing uh, geolocated tweets on elevation maps. And so we were using on top of that like 2D textures to show like visual cues of like where tweets were happening and stuff like that. But uh, today I'm not gonna be talking about data visualization. In particular, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about uh, JavaScript. So there are a lot of different graphics APIs for JavaScript, and that's like, actually really interesting. You have SVG, WebGL, 2D Canvas. Uh, there's a reason why the main thread where JavaScript is running, it's called the UI thread. Um, so for me, JavaScript is a medium to create graphics. Um, actually, how many of you like, do graphics with JavaScript? How many of you like, use either SVG, 2D Canvas, WebGL, something like that? That's a bunch of people. Um, so in particular, I'm gonna be talking about WebGL because uh, it's really interesting because it has its own domain-specific language to do graphics. So it's a language that has been thought uh, in order to, to make graphics with it. So it has a lot of interesting features for it. Um, so WebGL started around uh, 1992. OpenGL started around 1992, sorry. WebGL is based out of OpenGL ES which uh, the first version was in 97, I think. And OpenGL ES 2.0, which is the one used on mobile devices, has, a, has a, an interesting difference, difference uh, compared to OpenGL uh, from the desktop, which is the fact of having like, something called a programmable pipeline. Um, before that, it was all static. And so I think I should try to introduce what a rendering pipeline is first to try to uh, show you how uh, GLSL, which is the DSL for WebGL, fits into the graphics stack. Uh, so basically, you have an array of XYZ points, right? There are floats, there are points in 3D space, you wanna visualize them. You put them into a buffer, which is a place in memory that the GPU can access, and then they go through a vertex shader uh, step. This vertex shader is orange because you can actually code the vertex shader. You code it in GLSL and you specify uh, you can, for example, translate, rotate, and scale those points. You can do like, you know, all these uh, transformations to the points. And this runs really fast because it's working on GLSL on the GPU. Then it goes to a triangle assembly step. Triangle assembly, you cannot program anything on it. Basically what it does is it tries to figure out how the points go together and to form faces out of those points because you wanna, you know, render an object in 3D, so it, it creates triangles from the points and then it puts the triangles uh, together to create those faces. Then it goes to the rasterization process. You have a 3D concept, a 3D object, right? But you wanna put it onto the screen. The screen is 2D, is pixels, right? So it needs to like project everything into the screen. And finally, there's a last step, which is a fragment shader step, in which you can also program, which is pretty cool. And you can decide what color will be for each pixel on the 2D screen. So basically you have a lot of you know, power into like deciding uh, how the rendering is done with this, with this language. So what's interesting about WebGL is the fact that you have a JavaScript API in order to send like, you know, data structures to the GPU, but you also have this specific domain specific language that you can use in order to like, uh, you know, create graphics really fast. So this language was designed for, for graphics. So let's have a look at it. Um, it kind of is like a C-like language. It has a lot of like built-in types and, and, and functions for graphics. Uh, and it also has something I, I'm really uh, interested in, which is called operator overloading. Uh, so this is like a sample of how this looks like. Uh, you can create you know, vectors of uh, two, three, and four components, and you, know, you can compose constructors. Uh, you can access different components of the vector by doing dot x, y, z, or x, y, z will create a new vec3 for you. You can call the components x or rgb because in the vertex shader you decide the position of the vertices, but on the fragment shader you decide the color of the points, right? So you can call them however you like. And also what's interesting is operator overloading, right? So on the last three lines you have like two vectors. You want to interpolate linearly between these two vectors, so what you do is just use the plus 
minus and stuff like that, which is really elegant and, and clean. Um, another interesting thing is that there are a lot of built-in functions in GLSL, and, and this could be easily added with JavaScript. But what's interesting is, is that most of these built-in functions are vector and matrices functions, but also they're like, you know, reflect and refract and stuff that you would normally do in graphics, um, not only in WebGL, but in other stuff as well. Uh, and finally, here's a, a, a quick, you know, uh, comparison of, you know, a language that has operator overloading and a language that does, do not. So basically, if you have a vector four and you want to interpolate through that, in GLSL, you just do the, the, the proper linear interpolation, right? Uh, whereas in JavaScript, you need to define your own vector classes, and then you need to call all these complicated methods that, that really kind of obfuscate what you're doing, and, and you cannot really understand uh, what's the end result. So at one point, you can start to wonder, like for me, since JavaScript is a medium to get to graphics, whether I'm just using the right tool for the right thing. And so I, I started to look back and try to see if I could find other people that were like ranting to get, you know, operator overloading on the language, and I uh, went to this guy, whose name is Guy, still Jr. Um, and this person basically is known, who knows Guy still Jr.? One person, okay. So he wrote uh, more than a couple of dozen papers around uh, Lisp. In one of those papers, he designed the language scheme. Uh, he uh, joined Sun to work on the JVM. He then became a Sun Fellow uh, you know, Java has generics. Uh, based on that, it's, it's his work, basically. He was on the ECMA TC39, uh, first spec for the ECMA script language, uh, and also is chair for, uh, was chair for other languages like the C language, Fortran, and currently is chair for the common Lisp. So uh, this is what, what he has to say about uh, using operator overloading in JavaScript. An operator can be overloaded in C++. But right now, operators in the Java programming language cannot be overloaded by the programmer, even though the names of methods may be overloaded. I would like to change that. I have said in the past, and will say now, that I think it would be a good thing for the Java programming language to add generic types and to let the user define overloaded operators. Just as a user can code methods in just the same way as methods that are built in, the user ought to have a way to define operators for user-defined classes that can be used in just the same way as operators that are built in. Sounds pretty reasonable, right? Uh, try to extend the language seamlessly to add new types, uh, to add new methods. Just like you overload methods in a native way, you could overload operators, right? So the general rationale be behind this is that, you know, you have a lot of people that want to use complex numbers, rational numbers, intervals, vectors, stuff like that. Should we add that? To, should we have that built in into the language, or should we just let the people extend the language and have the language grow as the set of users grow? And, and that's exactly what he points out. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think Java has operator overloading. Uh, let's hope JavaScript does. Um, so there's this proposal called value objects. In particular, it, it's run by the same rationale. There are many use cases, people that want to use in 64 and other types uh, in JavaScript. The main idea is to have overloadable operators, to make it feel seamless within the language, to extend the language, to have those sort of things, uh, to preserve Boolean algebra, so to have uh, these types behave uh, intuitively and not counterintuitively to, to Boolean operators, um, to preserve relational relations, uh, trichotomy. Basically, if A is larger than B, not have A be less than or equal than B. Basically, not have like weird things. Um, and finally, have a strict equality, like triple equals, behave as usual. Uh, and have a literal syntax, be able to extend the language uh, in, in a more seamless way. But how did we get here? And basically, there's a long timeline of different proposals for operator overloading. Every time somebody, I don't know if you follow yes discuss, but somebody like talks about you know, adding the decimal type and then that becomes like into an operator overloading conversation and then it dies and then it, it re resurrects into some other proposal. So uh, the first one that I know about uh, happened on ES4 and it's in the ES4 draft in October 2007. Basically it was about generic functions. Have this way to define classes and then have functions that are defined separate from this class. And the interesting thing about this function is that they work with something called uh, dynamic dispatch or, or multi-methods. Uh, 
In particular, I'm going to try to explain what dynamic dispatch is. So if you're familiar with uh, the Java programming language, uh, let's say you have a class which is called person, and you have two methods within that class. Um, so they're, they're overloaded, right? So if you, if you create a food um, type of variable, but you, you add a new pasta, which is a subclass of food, right? And then you code the method, method eat, this uh, will print eating food. And this is kind of counterintuitive, right? It should, be, it should be saying eating pasta. But since the type of the food variable there is food, then uh, it is decided before runtime that it should be calling eating food. Uh, whereas if you extend the person class with John, say, and then now you say john.eat uh, pasta, then in this case, it will still call the, the method that was defined under food, but it will call uh, the method on John and not on person. So basically, on the receiver of the method, you are deciding at runtime uh, which should be the met method that it's called. On the arguments of the method, you're deciding before runtime where it should be called. I hope that wasn't too confusing. Um, so basically, if you think about a Java method as a function in which the first argument of the function is the receiver of the method, the instance where the method is being called, and the rest of the arguments are the normal arguments of the method, then you'll say that the first argument is dynamically dispatched. The other arguments are done statically. Uh, and so as, uh, as opposed to like some other languages like common lisp or like common lisp object system in which you have uh, proper dynamic dispatching in which you have like all the arguments of the method are defined at runtime. And so you do, you do this dispatch at runtime. So imagine the power of being able to do that. Like Java already has the power of subclassing. Imagine the power of having methods that are, you know, all the call, all the call for that method, the dispatching is done at runtime. So there were a few issues with this. Um, there are incredibly complex inheritance rules to resolve dispatch ambiguities. And there were other arguments within the ESDiscuss mailing list that, you know, decided people to like abandon this, this uh, idea. Um, and so in January 2009, there was another proposal by Mark S. Miller, um, which is kind of like similar to like the small talk kind of behavior of, of defining operator overloading. Basically, you define a plus method within the number in the prototype. And then you try to handle that depending on the argument you get. So you know, plus is a binary operator, so we will get only one argument in the function, which is the uh, right argument of the binary operator. If, if number knows how to handle this, then it will return uh, something intuitive. If it doesn't know how to handle this, it will call the reverse plus operator and send it itself as the argument of the method. So let's say that you know, you know how to handle numbers, so you do three plus one. It's, imagine you're doing three dot plus parenthesis one parenthesis. Then three, if three knows how to handle a number, it would return four. If it doesn't, then it will call the reverse plus operator on one. Um, so this was actually based, or there were a previous proposal by uh, Michael Dongling um, before, and this was in extend script, which is a part of Adobe. And this was working already, and people were, were playing with this. Uh, the, the, the API is slightly different because instead of calling the reverse plus operator, you call you use a second argument, which is a Boolean value that says whether you're sending you know, the method to the proper receiver or you're using the reverse one. Um, and the problem with this is one problem that you don't really have with the generic functions. Instead of defining generic functions or multi-methods outside of the class and defining one for each you know, type of argument, you have this sort of like switch in which you know, you're saying like, well, you know, if you do like three plus a complex number, you're saying like, or if I'm getting a number, then return this. If I'm getting a complex number, then do this. And if I don't know how to handle this class, then at the end call the reverse plus operator. So there are a lot of problems with like, you know, scalability in that sense or in, in like, you know, proper elegant code design. Um, then uh, operator overloading was revisited by Christian Plesner Hansen in 2009 in June. And it was a very similar approach to the generic functions one. I'm not going to go uh, very deep into this. It was uh, just adding a static uh, method in the function uh, class. And it was very similar to the generic function approach. So it had the same issues, basically. 
Uh, so in 2010, January, there's a page that's created in the S wiki uh, that basically uh, is very interesting because it talks about having value types that are you know, objects that behave like primitives. So again, this idea of extending uh, you know, seamlessly the language to add new types uh, and you know, to have operator overloading and stuff like that. Uh, in December 2010, there's a conversation about having value proxies uh, as a way of extending operator overloading. So basically, a proxy is a way to uh, create an object that intercepts uh, method calls or accessors. So if you don't know how to use a proxy, for example, let's say you have an object, and then you create a proxy of that object, you can uh, pass in a handler, and this handler will have uh, meta-methods, basically, that will be called whenever you're accessing a property. So for example, if you're deleting the proxies, uh, a proxy's property, then in the handler object, the method delete property will be called first. So if you freeze the, the proxy, for example, the freeze method in the handler will be called first. So it's a nice way to have, to intercept everything that's happening to an object. And so the same way you could extend the handler to have like add and mold and other type of you know, methods that will be called when, whenever you're using the plus between two proxies and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, after seven years, there is no real consensus on how, like, as far as I know, on how, like, a user will be able to define their own value types. There are lots of, like, built-in value objects that are build, being created, but not no uh, clear API. Uh, so I'm stealing this, this actual slide from uh, Brendan Eich uh, from his last presentation. It's a really uh, interesting slide because it kind of, kind of lays out the way in which a person would be able to create a value, a type, basically, and a way to create a, a methods from that type. But still, I'm not sure if this is going to be the last, uh, the last word on it or not. So yeah, I mean, from the perspective of a graphics guy, I would really love to, to have these sort of uh, things implemented. So yeah, I hope you like my summary of you know, the timeline of uh, how operator overloading is being covered. And uh, yeah, if I have some news on that, I will probably publish them on my website. Thanks. Thank you.